for better days to come and carry us like wind in our sails. Hold on tight, I can smell the shore, it's right in front of us if we just hold on tight. This vision that I saw is getting closer every dawn. Dreamers of the to another of my podcasts, the Freya Knitz podcast, and this is episode number 12. So you're all so welcome here. Thank you so much for joining me again. Um, thank you to all the returning viewers for all your support, all your amazingly wonderful comments, and thank you to the new viewers and new subscribers. Um, and if you haven't yet subscribed to this channel and you like the content, please do so, because I think there is a lot of, um, it's over 50%, of uh, views um, uh, are from people who haven't subscribed so perhaps it's the fact that maybe they've moved on and they don't like the content but just make sure that if you do like it please subscribe it really really helps the channel to spread and grow and I think we have a visitor from <laughs> my wonderful cat Gatto is coming to say hello as he usually does during the podcast he's usually looking for my attention as soon as I start talking to the camera so um, I have a wonderful mug of uh, hot coffee. This is a beautiful um, uh, ceramic work of art, really, um, that was given to me by my sister at Christmas time from a local potter in Clamac Noise in County Westmeath, I think, or the County Offaly. Anyway, it's near Athlone. And uh, this is a beautiful uh, piece which I love drinking my coffee from. So I'm having a really lovely, relaxing Sunday afternoon here. Um, really looking forward to sharing with you all of the gorgeous um, things that I am up to, all of the crafty goodness and uh, the knitting. And uh, I'm also really looking forward to talking to you about the um, Irish customs and traditions surrounding Bealtaine, which is what's coming up now on the 1st of May. So it's the one of the cross-border days, one of the most important of them. It marks the beginning of summer which is fantastic. I've been out walking today in the sunshine, really enjoying this lovely sunny weather. And um, yeah, so Bealton is coming up. I'll be talking to you a little bit about that. I'll be talking to you a little bit, bit about the Hawthorn bush, which is also known as a fairy bush. Um, so an enchanted type of tree that grows all over the country. And in this, at this, this time of the year, it just bursts into this amazing white blossom. So it's very much associated with Ah, so um, sit back and relax and uh, get yourself a nice hot cup of something to drink or a cool drink if you're in a really hot place and um, yeah and just relax for the next hour or so and uh, we can talk through my projects. So um, just to remind you my name it's Anya. I'm Anya and come from uh, come to you from the west of Ireland so I am honest in on Instagram 
and it's at Freachnitz. Freach means heather, um, and it's a word that I associate with, well, this part of the country that I'm living in is really mountainous and rural and it's full of heather. Um, and I adore the colour, I adore the plant, and I adore the sound of the Irish word Freach. Um, so you're very welcome to um, look me up on Instagram. I, I do a lot of, I share a lot of my projects as, the, as works in progress on Instagram. The sun is coming out now, which um, I hope it doesn't affect the, um, the filming. Um, it's nice to have a bit of sunlight, but let's hope it, it works out okay. So, um, yeah, so to get on with the knitting, well, what am I wearing? This is one of my finished objects. And once Gotto steps down out of the way, you can see it properly. So he is, or the finished object is um, the Kevat top by Caitlin Hunter and I knit it using Life in the Long Grass sport weight uh, yarn um, in the cutaway storm. So it's a semi-solid and I um, used the colour work. Colour is this beautiful yarn here which is the um, also Life in the Long Grass and this is a fingering weight and it's a variegated yarn and it is called uh, Thorn. So yeah, these two yarns together work really well together because actually the storm is, even though it may look grey when you look at it closely or when you look at it in natural light, it actually has this beautiful red tinge to it. So the red tinge in the grey is picked up by the red in the, in the thorn. And it's a really appropriate name for it as well because storm clouds are often sort of tinged with this red glow um, for the brewing storm. Uh, yeah, so it's it's just a lovely colour combination. I adore that the pattern by Caitlin Hunter is just perfect. I mean, her patterns are just so easy to follow. They always fit well. They're just such a pleasure to knit and um, I'll definitely be knitting more of them in the future. Definitely well worth checking out Caitlin Hunter. Boyland Knitworks is her other title or the name of her business. And um, so the top is being knit for, it was knit for the Irish Cal, which is at Seanach Yarns, Sophie, and at Dublin Network, Diane. Uh, Diane and Sophie have organised this knit along uh, to encourage people to use, come together as a community, really, apart from anything else, and also to uh, become aware of the huge number of Irish, um, both Irish designers and Irish hand dyers and Irish producers of yarn that exist in this country at the moment. So it's really growing and uh, it's very exciting to be able to um, to support Irish designers and Irish yarn. So, yep, this is my one. I The reason I didn't choose an Irish design is because I already had the yarn uh, for this particular pattern. I bought this last August actually, um, and I decided not to knit it at the time because I wasn't really that happy with, I think I showed you the swatch on the previous one. I actually would show you what I knit instead at that time. I knit this top, which you've seen before, which I still haven't woven in all the ends, but this is a version of uh, Albina McLaughlin's um, Trasnu top, except her Trasnu top, the reason it's called a Trasnu top is because Trasnu means a cross or crossroads, um, so there's a, a cross straps, um, so it's a sort of a summer top um, that just has straps at the top and I, when I was knitting it, I thought I would like it and then I just decided, no, I actually want to cover up up here, especially in this country, we just don't get the weather really for um, wearing sort of strappy tops. Um, anyway, so this is what I did instead. I made my own uh, measurements. I sort of worked out, calculated for the oak and uh, so knit the Trasnu top on the basis of her pattern from the hem up to the, the sleeve separation and the rest of it then is my own. But anyway, just the point I was going to make to you was that this grey in this top is the same yarn as uh, I got originally for the Kevat. And um, I was amazed at how much I managed to get out of three skeins of this yarn. So that's 300 grams of the sport weight. I used nearly one of them in this, or maybe just short of 100 grams. And then with the other two and a, and a bit, I managed to get the whole of this top out of that. And I managed to get the um, the red that I used here was what I was using from my um, um, what's it called the Big Spite Shawl by Vera Valmaki, which is my other finished object, which I'm going to show you in a minute. So out of 
yeah, I, I'm just, the yarn seems to be like the lowest and the fishes in this house at the moment. I seem to be getting a load of projects out of just um, what yarn I actually have. So my big ambition this year, or my big sort of effort is to try and use everything that I have in the house, not to be bringing in any more yarn because I have so much of it at the moment. And it's actually such a, a, a really good challenge because it really makes you appreciate what you have. Because um, sometimes you think, oh, I'm not going to knit with that. I don't have a pattern for it. But it's, but really, it's a case of bringing it out every so often, looking at it, um, remembering what patterns you've seen since you bought the yarn that actually you you might be able to use the yarn for, or what's what's inspiring you about the yarn that um, yeah you could you could use it for something. Because your ideas change all the time, and unless you bring out the yarn again to look at it. You, know, you might have bought it and had an idea for it and then put it away and then forgotten about it or had that fixed idea in your head still that didn't work out at the time and yet there's so much potential in every ball of yarn there's so much potential so anyway um that's what i've had great fun doing using up the yarn that i have and getting mileage huge mileage out of it which is absolutely brilliant i'm just going to keep an eye on the time here so that we don't go over um, so where was I going? Oh yeah, the next finished object then. So it's the Big Spike Shawl, which I showed to you in the last episode. And this is it finished. As you can see, no ends woven in. The usual story with me until the last minute. But that is it. Absolutely and fully complete. So I'm absolutely thrilled with how that worked out. Um, loads of mistakes. I'm going to show, throw it on here and uh, we can see... There are a load of mistakes because it is my first ever brioche attempt and um, but as you can see it's just a stunning stunning pattern. Um, so uh, with the mistakes I'm just going to go back over while I'm doing the excuse me while I'm doing in the weaving in of the ends I'm going to go and check all along the sides you can see there's a hole here and that kept happening to me where I'd be getting a hole where I was increasing on one of the sides. My increasing um, uh, in brioche I found really tricky to get the hang of. But there is one line in the pattern which I think actually should be highlighted in bold and made into big letters which tells you how to get over that problem which is basically that when you do, you're doing yarn over increases on one side and then when you turn the work those yarn over increases appear as single stitches and I was mistaking them for stitches that you had to knit together because of, of everything in brioche being sort of uh, double. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> I'm wondering if it makes any sense to me, but it, it was something, basically each of those stitches is counted as one stitch. Um, so they become one, you know, of the sort of uh, vertical lines in, in the brioche. And I think I was making the mistake that I was counting them as double. So I was getting this happened. It was sort of a frequently recurring thing that kept happening, even though I tried to get over it. Eventually I figured it out, but I do have stuff to go back over. Um, but it just shows you, I think if you keep going, even if there are these little mistakes, they can be rectified later by with using a little bit of, of uh, leftover yarn and, and a needle. Um, and that there's a needle hanging out of this at the moment, actually, which is attached to a piece of yarn that is holding the stitch that I dropped. So yeah, there's all sorts of things that you can get over. You know, there's no panic really um, if things don't work out the first time. So I'm really proud of this and I absolutely adore the uh, finished object. Beautiful design by Vera Valimaki called Big, Big Spite. And this is one of the yarns. So I managed to get this shawl finished, this top colour work done out of one skein of this and that, um, yarn and that's the amount I have left over. So really, really good value. Um, beautiful soft 100% merino singles from Life in the Long Grass, one of my favourite yarns and an Irish yarn as well. So um, so actually this could be for the Irish cow but actually I think I'd started it before that started. Anyway, um, that's the end of, of the, the Big Spite. Um, that's another finished object. So I have two more finished objects to show you and both of them are socks. Um, one of them is one you saw the last time where I was showing you the um, this beautiful project by Sox Explorations. It's a design by Denise DeSantis 
from Earthstone's Girl. Um, so it's called Socksplorations and she shows you how to do, through video tutorials, how to do the shadow wrap short row heel, um, which I find a really, really lovely, easy to memorize, beautiful looking heel. So um, yeah, that's the Socksplorations. So I had one of these finished the last time and I'm just showing you the pair. Um, they're both done and I've been wearing them and they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, so I mixed uh, merino singles with um, silk mohairs, three different colours. Um, I explained it in detail in the last podcast. And I did leave the, the cuffs, the heels and the toes are left without mohair. And the reason I did that, it might seem crazy because actually they're the parts of the sock that probably need the mohair the most because the mohair, the silk mohair um, adds strength to the merino. That's why I was doing it this way. But I left this colour without it because I wanted it to be pure pink because I wanted this, the contrast to be high. I loved the colour, I love the colour of this. It's a Merlino, it's called Merlino, so it's actually got linen in it. Um, it's 90% Merino, 10% linen by Walk Collection. And it is, um, so with the Merino, sorry, with the linen, I figured, look, you know, there'll be some strength in it and it can do without, the, we'll get away with not having the, the um, silk mohair in it, but we'll see. I don't wear them too much, as in I don't wear them out during the day, so they're not rubbing up and down in my, in my shoes. Um, and yeah, I just wear them around the house. Really, really cozy, really warm, but actually not too warm either. I was afraid that my feet would be too hot, but they're not at all. Um, it's amazing how natural materials are just so kind to your body that you know they allow your skin to breathe and they're so so comfortable they become you know they keep the temperature they regulate the temperature of your body and uh, natural natural yarns do natural fibers and uh, they're really the only way to go with socks because i know that um i um i find i can't wear anything uh any nylon at all um i just find it it's just clogs up my my skin so this is a uh, this is a way to go if you don't want to use nylon in your socks you can use the silk mohair and um, a little goes a long way as well I still have tons of this so the silk mohair that I'm using here is actually from um, uh, I bought about four or five balls of it it's uh, Rowan Kid Silk Haze and I bought it in a little shop in a northern Italian town that I visited last summer I have friends there and uh, went into the shop and there it was sitting on the countertop on sale and I said oh I'll have some of that because I knew I'd heard that it was beautiful yarn and uh, so I have tons of it in my stash and I haven't used it for anything so why not put it into a pair of socks. So that's that project. So now I'm going to just check the time on the camera. So we're good, we actually have another three or four minutes left, which gives me a chance to talk to you about this project. So this is um, uh, the second finished object, or sorry, it's my fourth finished object, the second sock. Um, so this is a project by uh, the Petite Knitter, or sorry, it's a, a pattern by the Petite Knitter called Ova Socks. And this is a colourwork sock which unfortunately you probably can't tell there's much colourwork. You can see the gorgeous sheep at the top here which came out really well but the rest of it you can't really see because of the marling effect of the the two yarns that I held together. Um, and I, when I started it I realised this was going to happen and I dithered as to whether to continue with the project would I continue to knit it knowing that I wouldn't be able to see the beautiful colourwork pattern. And I went into my stash and I looked for a colour that was closer to this rust colour. And I did have some mohair, silk mohair, but it's a really expensive one. And it's for my uh, rust coloured cardigan project that I haven't finished yet. And I thought, oh, I don't really want to use that now because I could be running out of it and uh, that would be a disaster. And it's hard to get, I can't get it here. I had to send away for it to Holland. So, um, yeah, so I decided to just go ahead. I wanted the... The thickness and the warmth of the, um, the colour work and um, yeah I just decided to go ahead. So the, um, the finished object is so light and airy and gorgeous and I want to show you the yarns that I used. So these are these are very special yarns from County Kilkenny from an Irish producer called Cushendale Woolen Mills and 
These are the colours actually, sorry, I didn't use this one. That's the label there. It's just simply called Irish Wool. It's a lace weight, 100% wool. And these are the colours that I used in this sock. And what's very interesting about this wool that I didn't realise until I went to, So I bought this in Kilkenny when I was visiting friends. I used to work in County Kilkenny um, years ago, uh, over 12 years ago. And I uh, was down there visiting friends and I went into the woollen mills. I got a beautiful tour of the place. If you're ever in Gregnamana is the name of the town in South East County Kilkenny on the River Barrow. It's a stunning, beautiful town. And this uh, woollen mills, Cushendale, run by Philip Cushion and their family have been there for six generations running this woolen mill and they um the yarn when i went onto the website to so i bought this about i don't know two years ago and i went onto the website to have a look again and find a little bit more out about the yarn and it was actually used in the um the jumpers in knitting for in the the film the banshees of Inisherin, so which i featured in my uh, last podcast I think, or the one before Knitting for the Banshees, that podcast. So if you look up that I talk about the um, uh, Delia Barry who was the knitter who produced those jumpers but what I didn't realise and what wasn't in that article, the New York Times article, was that this yarn was uh, from Cushendale, the yarn that was used was Cushendale Woolen Mills Irish, 100% Irish yarn, or Irish wool. And actually it is, I'll just read it to you there, it is made with wool from Ireland's only native sheep called the Galway, which is both rare and protected. So actually that's the same Galway wool that I was showing you in another previous podcast that's now being produced uh, in a, on a larger scale by the Galway Wool Cooperative, I think it's called, um, So, which is run, run in County Galway. It's Hi everyone, yeah, it's good to be back again. I just got cut off there with the camera running out of space. So I'm just taking a nice sip of my coffee again. And we'll continue on with what I was talking about. So I was telling you about these wonderful socks, the Ova socks um, by the Petite Knitter and the, the fact that I was using Irish wool, this beautiful uh, wool from Kilkenny and I don't know if I actually managed to say um, a little bit about the fact that um, when you knit the second sock you do the main colour changes from so it'll be changed from rust to jade so I'm really looking forward to doing that in the second sock so they're sort of going to be like odd socks but I don't mind because uh, I love that idea of um, mixing and matching anyway because I never can find a pair of matching socks in my house. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to doing the second sock. The other thing I was going to say to you is that I used, uh, the pattern uses an afterthought heel. So I can't remember, I don't think I told you this already, but the afterthought heel is definitely not one that I would do again because I didn't have the, I didn't feel I had the control over understanding whether the sock fit me or not. I couldn't try it on because you're literally knitting a tube and then you're knitting a, a piece of yarn into that that is sacrificial. You take it out and you um, you uh, pick up stitches on either side and knit the heel as in the same way that you knit the toe. So it's like uh, decreasing um, every second row and then every row for a few rows. So yeah, so I think I would actually not use the afterthought heel method again for that reason really for the fact that it's a bit of a faff as well picking up stitches um i didn't really enjoy it i'm much more um i much more enjoyed working the um shadow wrap short row heel on these beautiful uh, socks here the, the uh, denise de santis ones so yeah um just a, pr a personal preference everybody's got their own preference for sock knitting um, but it's interesting for me because I'm not a sock knitter really, or I haven't been up to this. I'm, I'm trying to do a sock every month or every podcast. And, um, excuse me, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to learn as many techniques as I can maybe and see which ones I like. I know I don't like the, shad the um, heel flap and gusset technique. It doesn't suit me at all. So yeah, so this is a really lightweight, gorgeous sock, Irish wool, together with the Rowan Kitsil Kays 
um, 100% Irish Galway wool so I'm very proud to be using Cushendale woolen mills and to find out as well that they are actually the wool that was used in the Banshees of Edith Sharon film and what a what an authentic um, film that that was in terms of not just getting a um, a knitter who could knit from knit patterns in the old style uh, without having to have a pattern uh, just from photographs so, so Delia Barry knit those jumpers from photographs of fishermen in the 1930s and these were really you know not easy to see the pattern on those jumpers but she created her own and she used wool from Galway sheep so that's a bit that, about that story that I didn't realize which is really important to know so really authentic jumpers they are that's an, a native sheep breed that is being revived here in Ireland which is absolutely fantastic so they are my finished objects so I have two works in progress to show you one of them which of one of which is very exciting altogether. I'm sorry now about this squeaky chair that I'm sitting on and uh, everything is falling around. Okay, so I am knitting the um, this absolutely fabulous pattern by um, Tori Yu is the name of the designer. New York designer and the pattern is called the downtown hoodie. Um, have I got it the right way around? Yeah that's the right way around. So I have actually amazingly got so it's a beautiful uh, hoodie top um, so it's a real sort of casual wear piece with um, uh, what are they called raglan sleeves and um, stripes so sporty type of uh, thin stripes that start just before you split, split for the sleeves. So I have actually got to the point where I am starting the first bit of colour and I've chosen, so the wool I'm using is this absolutely beautiful Old Centrum, Old Centrum Anthracite, which is a sport weight um, Gotland wool, Swedish wool and Gotland sheep, I think. Mostly it has that beautiful sheen off it and this absolutely stunning red, I think it's called Falu Red. This is actually one of my favourite reds. The, the colours that the Old Centrum um, company used to dye their wools, or the, the colours that they choose for me are just absolutely in, out of this world. I love this colour. It's such a strong, um, and I think it may be because it's over dyed on dark wool, possibly. That's why it has this depth to it, such such depth and such a beautiful scarlet red. So these two colours together in my favourite woolly wool, which is Old Centrum. And it's actually so nice to be going back to woolly wools because for a while there, a lot of my projects have been in um, Superwash. So this is Superwash Merino, all of the Life in the Long Grass that I use. They do, Life in the Long Grass do produce other other wools but I've been using their superwash which is actually a really lovely version of superwash it doesn't feel it's very pleasant to knit with you know it, it's not but it's, it's certainly not a woolly wool um, that's fine you know everything has its as its use the drape in this is perfect and the lace work in the in the um, life in the long grass superwash merino is fabulous um, but this wool I've had in my stash for about oh my goodness since I started knitting which is now about four years ago actually and I ordered a load of it because I had actually so I knit the um, the shawl that's on the back of this chair that you see every time I hop up and down is um, knit in Shetland um, Spindrift and uh, Jameson's of Shetland Spindrift and I knit by the same designer Maria Dahan I also knit a um, another shawl very similar to this one, uh, which is a shawl representing li island life on um, Uland. Um, and um, that's knit with the with Old Centrum yarns and the colours are stunning. I must show it to you again. It's in one of my previous podcasts actually. It's the All the Colour Work podcast. I think it might be number four. So if you want to look back at that, that shows you me. Um, I show the shawl and talk about Old Centrum yarns. So yeah, I've had this black, uh, this anthracite since then and haven't been able to find a pattern that I was happy to use it for. But this this pattern, I just instinctively, when I saw it recently, it's a very new pattern, 
by Tori U. I thought, oh, that's going to work perfectly. And it's the type of top that I would be able to, to wear all the time. You know, it's a sort of a casual top. Um, so this went up really quickly. I think I've been knitting so many projects that are slow knitting, like the brioche, the lace work, the, um, the other jumper I'm, I'm knitting, which is the, or it's, a, it's the, the cardigan, the zip up cardigan, which is full of cables. So I've got cables, brioche and lace work, lace, uh, patterns on the go, or I have had until recently. And to do this, this took me literally, I don't know, a few nights of knitting to do plain stocking stitch. So actually, I'm just delighted to be back doing it. And knitting this wool is just, every stitch for me is heaven. It's absolutely, the, the texture of it is so gorgeous. Even though it's woolly, you know, you could say that it's scratchy, but there's some quality about Old Centrum wool that it's just, for me, out of this world. It's a beautiful, beautiful wool to work with. And uh, not just to, not just for the finished product, but the actual uh, process of knitting it. It's just so enjoyable. So I'm using a 3.5 millimeter needle. I'm knitting the size five, which I hope is gonna give me plenty of positive ease. Um, I had to adjust the stitch count because, or the gauge rather, because this, no, I didn't adjust the, the gauge is the same as the pattern calls for, but the stitch count I think is different because the uh, it's for a DK weight yarn. So this is sport weight, but having said that, the some of the, I think the different colors in um, Old Centrum might be different weights. This is quite a thick weight, this the black, and um, and also it's really uneven. So um, it's sort of, it's, it's such a different experience knitting with it because you might be knitting with a, you know, reasonable sort of, thickness of yarn and then all of a sudden you, you reach a stage where it's quite clumpy and then it's thicker and then it goes to thread sometimes um, and the thing is really not to work about worry about it because actually at the end of the day the fabric it produces just seems so perfect and even it's like how did it do that out of all of these different thicknesses anyway uh yeah really really looking forward to, to actually wearing this piece but also i'm having such a nice time knitting it i have to say it's a pleasure to knit just plain stocking, stocking stitch um, after knitting all of those uh, projects, which involved a lot of thinking and a lot of um, time. So re really nice project to, to, to move on to. So I don't think I have anything else to say about that at the moment. It's going well and uh, hopefully I'll have more to show you in the next podcast episode. Um, the other one that I'm working on at the moment that you've seen before, and I just thought I'd throw it in here because I have made a fair bit of progress on it, is the um, is my half and half triangles wrap, which half the world is knitting. This is a free pattern by Pearl Soho. It's garter stitch, absolute pleasure as well to knit this. Um, and this I'm using Pearl Soho's recommended wool, which is the um, linen quill. And this colorway is, uh, I forget actually, it's a, one of the greens. I forget the name of it. It'll come to me in a minute. But anyway, so I'm doing really well. Um, and once you get to a certain stage with this, it actually seems to fly. The first bit of it takes forever. Um, but then it gets to, once it starts going, you really motor along. And it's another lovely one to knit when you're tired or you can't think. Um, and this is the other gorgeous color that I'm doing with it. This is. Uh, I have the label here so I can actually tell you what this colour is. Um, oh, there it is. It's wheat flour. So this is wheat flour and juniper green, I think, is the name of this colour. So, really beautiful project. Um, there, this is the linen quill. is such a beautiful, it looks rustic, but it's really soft. There's a load of linen in it. I think it's 15% linen, 35% alpaca, which makes it really soft and 50% uh, Peruvian Highland wool. So absolutely stunning wool from Pearl Soho. Um, and I have more of that in my stash actually. So I'm looking forward to knitting with more of that. I have so much wool from the last couple of years where I spent, uh, I kept ordering because I was really excited about all the new woods out there. But I'm trying this year not to be buying so much. One of the sort of exceptions to that rule is that I'm going to allow myself to buy wool if I'm in a shop that sells it, that sells nice wool. So we don't have very many of them around here, as I've said before, but I know that I'm going to be going to the UK at, uh, for a summer holiday, walking, uh, doing a walking holiday with friends over there. And um, 
I am definitely going to be buying wool while I'm there because I'm going to be driving over. I'm going to take the ferry over and uh, drive uh, drive um, over to Wales and England and I will be certainly coming near several yarn shops and who knows I might even be able to coincide with a festival. That would be the most amazing thing because I've never been to a yarn festival and I'd love it. So that's my one exception for acquiring wool. So I have no acquisitions. I haven't bought any wool at all this year and I'm feeling really, really good about that. I'm feeling very, um, what's the word? Yeah, very proud of myself uh, for not having to buy any more and for actually making use of what I have. And actually the, it's that constraint, I think, of having to um, really think about what you have and match it up to something, a pattern that, that you know is going to work with that wool, that that for me is a part of the pleasure, a huge part of the, of the joy I get out of knitting, is that it's the whole planning of the thing. Um, it, and sometimes I get even more... Hi everybody and welcome back. Um, I'm just having another little bit of coffee here. I think I got cut off just talking to you a little bit about the process of knitting that I enjoy most is often the planning of it and planning a project and looking through Ravelry and looking at other podcasters and getting inspiration from them and uh, yeah and looking at what wool I actually have and reimagining that wool as something completely different because it just can become so many things and that for me is really a huge part of the pleasure of knitting is all of that planning and um, creating something I suppose completely individual and we could, we all do such different things using the same materials um, and uh, amazing patterns so yeah that's what I was talking about so what I wanted to just finish up with this is the end of the knitting content for the podcast by the way uh, just to let you know thank you so much for watching if you're not interested in the Irish cultural section um, this is the, the point at which I start talking about that. So thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the content so far, please remember to like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It really helps me. It helps to spread the channel. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your feedback as well. If you have any comments, please leave them below. And um, I will link all the patterns below and I will put up any of the information in relation to the, the woods that I've been using or um, the, uh, yeah, the patterns that I've used. So um, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Bialtana and about the hawthorn tree or the hawthorn bush. So I actually brought in some, I picked some hawthorn yesterday and uh, this is it here. I've got two branches of absolutely stunning hawthorn. This reminds me the shape of the branches and the blossoms remind me of uh, Japanese prints. Uh, printmaking and um, there's something really timeless and absolutely beautiful about uh, these branches and the shape of the uh, of the branches and the beautiful blossom. So Ireland is covered in this is known as hawthorn or white thorn also known as sgeach gial. Sgeach is the Irish word for a bush and gial mean, means bright uh, so it's bright bush and it is um, everywhere all over the countryside growing wild and um, in, at this time of the year in May in the beginning at the end of April beginning of May the, the the hedgerows and the fields where the bushes are growing turn white so it's a bit like um, yeah it's, it's just such a reminder of the time of the year that this is the beginning of summer and it's a time to celebrate and uh, it's really beautiful it's a beautiful plant to see to see growing wild. The other thing about the Shkiach Gael or the Hawthorn is that it is uh, it was considered one of the I think the common trees of the wood so it was it was given this, it, all of the trees in um, the time of the Druids were given uh, various uh, rankings so oak would have been the top the noble of the wood and working down through to the bushes of the wood. So this is one of the bushes, one of the commoners of the wood. But in spite of that, in spite of its ranking being lower than oak, it was still held, like all trees were held in absolutely the highest regard um, by the Druids because actually they believed that um, all, all beings, including trees, plants, flowers, um, animals, rocks, um, the earth itself was a living being and that there was soul running through 
all of these things. I mean, this is very similar to other Native traditions, Native American uh, culture and um, other Indigenous traditions throughout the world. And I think it's just something that we need to return to, this idea that um, everything is a living thing and we are, we are connected to everything in the world. And if we harm anything in any way, then there are repercussions for us. And that, that whole notion of harming trees, um, it's brought out in the Irish folklore associated with the Shkach, with the Shkach Gael. Um, this is known as a fairy tree, and actually the fact that I'm holding this branch inside the house is thought to be unlucky, so fingers crossed, it's not too unlucky, but I didn't take this from a fairy tree, even though hawthorn bushes are sometimes known as fairy trees. Um, but I didn't take it from a lone tree would be considered a fairy tree or a tree, a hawthorn tree that grows on a, a rat or a ra. The Irish name for a ring fort uh, is a ra. It's also known as a lis. And you'll hear these names coming into Irish place names uh, all over the country. Um, so hawthorn trees are the sciachgal that grow in ring forts or that grow as single trees that stand out on their own are thought to be fairy trees and magical trees and if you um, the folklore goes that if you cut down one of those trees then you'll be um, you know there'll be consequences basically that the fairies are the, like fairies the word fairy probably it's not the type of fairy with wings that um, you might see in uh, I don't know folk tales um, it's these the fairies in, in Ireland in the Irish sort of tradition are um, they're the she they're the, the Irish word for them is she and actually banshee the banshees of Inish Erin that film again uh, the banshee in that film you see is an old woman so um, she the ban, ban means woman and she means fairy or so they're, the a fairy means a being from the other world so the she um, the ring forts were they are the are the, is the place where um, there is fairy magic and also these lone hawthorn trees uh, were thought to have fairy magic as well so as in she magic um, yeah so they're an absolutely beautiful looking bush they they represent the beginning of uh, the summer Bialtana, the first of May so Bialtana literally means um, Bial or Bell Tina, so Tina means fire, and Bell fights someone as Bell. Bell was a character, actually. I had I never got to the bottom of that when I was reading who Bell was, but certainly it's Bell's fire. Um, or also translated as bright fire, I think, as well in places. But fire because um this the Bialtana is one of the also pronounced Beltane, but actually Bialtana is the correct Irish uh, pronunciation of it, the original pronunciation, and it is the one of the uh, very important cross-quarter days that I've spoken about before. So when I started this podcast last July, the first thing, the first cross-quarter day that was coming up at the time was Lunasa. So Lunasa represented the harvest season, and then Samhain um, represented the, is Halloween, and that represents the, um, uh, the turning of the year, and then you had, um, so that would be the end of the year, or the begin, the beginning, so got this mixed up, so sound is the beginning of the year, then Imbolc, which is the, uh, happens on the 1st of February, St. Bridget's Day, Imbolc is the harbinger of spring, and then uh, Bialtana is the beginning of summer. So they're the cross-quarter days, and they were considered really important days in the Celtic calendar because they are halfway between the equinoxes and the um, solstices. And as such, they're considered liminal times or in-between times. And anything liminal or in-between in the Celtic world was considered a time when the fairies were close to us, when, when the veil between the other world and our world grows thin. So um, Bialtana is a time of great superstition. Um, the superstition surrounding these trees still exists actually. Um, so there, um, I'll tell you a story of, in terms of how highly regarded these trees are um, in relation to a motorway that was being built in 1999, so that's 24 years ago now, so not that long ago. Um, the motorway, the M18, so running through County Clare, 
um, I think near Ennis, between Ennis and Gort, I think, uh, in a place called, I forget now. Um, anyway, there was, a, there was a tree growing there and a local, um, <clears throat> a shanaki called Eddie Linehan, and I actually highly recommend looking up Eddie Linehan's um, stuff. He's a shanaki a storyteller, and you'll find him on YouTube. Uh, there are loads of YouTube videos of him speaking, and he tells, he has gathered and collected stories from um, people um, older people who um, who still carry these folk tales, and he found out that this tree was going to be cut down as part of the building of the motorway, and he wrote a letter to the uh, as it was then the National Roads Authority, and to the uh, the press, and the whole thing snowballed anyway, and it turned out that um, he got support from all over the world. And the motorway was diverted to allow for the tree to remain in existence. But his his uh, understanding of it was that if the tree had been knocked down, so this is a lone hawthorn tree. So there are hawthorns everywhere, but some of them are special fairy trees, particularly the ones that are, are stand alone. And you can tell, he says that you can tell that they have they have a presence about them. But they've also got um, three, I think, three branches coming out of the one. So they're ancient. They're old, old trees. Um, and they are the uh, the dwelling places of, of the fairies. But his, his, under, his understanding and folk understanding is that if that tree had been cut, then the motorway would have been, um, there would have been accidents, car accidents on the motorway in that section. That's what, that was what his, his take on it was. And actually, so he, he won his case and the motorway was diverted. And um, it just shows the, the level of respect that there still is across the country for for, for the fairy trees and also for fairy forts. So what are the fairy forts? They're ring forts, they're Lis, Lisana or Rahana, and they are, um, they were actually, the, the earthworks. So they're sort of a pile of um, earthen banks that were built to protect um, dwelling places of, um, this is how people lived in, in, in Ireland, going way back to the, the Iron Age. So, so these forts, the rem remnants of these forts, so there are these big earthworks that would have been uh, topped with palisade fences to, to protect the, the livestock from wolves and raiders and as places where, where dwelling houses were built. So all the dwelling houses have gone because there would have been wattle and daub and thatch and whatever. But the earthworks still remain and on these earthworks you can see hawthorn trees have sprung up. Um, so the hawthorns on these uh, fairy forts are rats of the ancient dwelling places that I mean, they, they date from the Iron Age all the way up through to the Middle Ages. And actually, um, so Manchin Magan is another book I'm going to show you about his book here, Listen, Listen to the Land Speak. This is another highly recommended book. He has a, ch a little chapter on ring forts. And according to him, there are 32,000 of them still existing in Ireland. So that number is just... Um, testament to the respect with which they're held and children are told not to go near them because they'll you know there's a fear of them uh, that the fairies dwell there and um, bad luck will come to you if you disrespect the fairies I mean you can still go and look at these places but yeah there's there's they're very interesting and um, that Shanachi um, Eddie Linhan tells of a, he brings visitors to to see these ring forts there's one particular strong one with strong energy about it um, that he brought, he was bringing a group of, of people and one Swedish uh, visitor apparently when they were leaving turned around and said we're being watched so like there's you know these visitors felt the presence so they're fascinating places so the Hawthorne is associated with with the fairies and with fairy forts um, and uh, so there are 32,000 of them still around the country and they can be recognised at this time of the year particularly. Well, you can see them, they're all over the place. If you look at any Ordnance Survey map of Ireland, there are little uh, red rings and they represent ring forts. So they were surveyed back in the 19th century by um, O'Curry and Donovan, John O'Donovan and, um, is it, I forget his first name, O'Curry anyway is his second name. So they were... Uh, surveyors for the, the Ordnance Survey. So this was when Ireland was under English control, British control, and but the, one of the really good legacies of that time of that control and that dom domination was these incredibly detailed Ordnance Survey maps. So they 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 actually were in the cultural uh, folklore, 
historical section and they gathered folklore and they recorded the location of all of the ring forts at the time um, and other archaeological sites as well were recorded by them. So um, they, there are 32,000 of them in the country. You can recognise them at this time of the year because of the hawthorns that have grown up. So they, the hawthorns form this ring around the top of the earthen embankment of, of these ring forts. So really well worth a visit. You can spot them anywhere from the, the, the roads. Um, you can see them on the maps, you can find them, you can go and visit them. And the one thing to do is respect them and uh, respect the, the, their places of, of the ancestors. And uh, yeah, people, people really do uh, believe that they're also a link to the other world. And because this time of the year, Bialtan is a liminal time, um, that, that, that link is, um, they're closer to us at that time of the year. That's what the folklore tells us, and actually, um, there's there's a lot to to, to learn from it. I think. Um, so a couple of traditions that come around at this time of the year um, are the lighting of bonfires. So Bealtaine, Bealtaine, um it's to do with uh, bonfires where you would drive your cattle through uh, a gap in a hedge where you'd be you would have the hawthorn on fire and grass. Uh, to, to cleanse them and to keep away the spirits, so to keep away the the evil spirits. And we had in the last pod podcast this whole idea of hairs, of shape-shifting. So the she are shapeshifters as well, it's it's thought. So that you had the um, the hair, uh, uh, sorry, the, the calich or the hag, the old woman, becoming the hair and the calich um, coming to the, the house on May Eve particularly, on Bealtaine, to steal the butter and the milk. So um, that was something that was thought that, that, that happened. So in order to protect against the hair or the, 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 the she coming to steal the butter and the milk, you would put up a hawthorn um, branch over the door to, to, to ward against the evil spirits, so to ward against the witches, the the, the, the calich. And that's a, that was a common thing. And also then to celebrate the fact that this is the beginning of the summer, you would also have had these uh, hawthorn branches decorated. This is something that I didn't know, but I've learned through reading the um, that lovely book by Neil McCutcher that I have showed before, which I'll show you again. It's the um, Ireland's trees. So he talks about the hawthorn in this. And so many of the trees actually in that book have references to May Eve. So it's not just the hawthorn, um, but the hawthorn features. And it was decorated with um, flowers and ribbons and eggshells and the eggshells that were kept from Easter were used to decorate um, these tr the, the branches and uh, scraps of bright material and sometimes rush lights were lit. So this was common all over the country that rush lights next to these trees were lit on May Eve. Uh, so this is all ceremony associated with the beginning of summer and with the protecting of the crops as well. So there was another thing that the crops were protected by um, uh, sprinkling hawthorn branches with uh, holy water and planting or sticking these hawthorn branches in the ground in the field to prevent uh, the fairies from uh, from taking crops and um, so this these these trees are just such a uh, particular hawthorn particularly hawthorn is associated with being able to connect with the fairies in some way to to show them respect to there were offerings made as well um, at fairy forts on May Eve um, to appease the fairies. Um, so in some places the tradition of leaving small gifts of food and drink at the fort, um, at a fairy fort or at a lone bush um, was carried out because the lone bushes as well were, the, were the, also seen as places where the fairies dwelt. So um, other customs included, oh yes, not to do with the Hawthorne but other May Eve or Bealtaine customs include the scattering of flowers at the threshold of, of, of a house to bring good luck on the household and this is actually so a lot of these traditions that I'm talking to you about have died out but this one of scattering the flowers actually still exists in the town very close to where I live uh, Westport town you see I, I remember coming here first and seeing the, the flowers scattered at the on the threshold of the doors in the town and wondering what that was um, I would never seen it before so it's still here it's amazing that tradition still exists um, of doing that and it's a beautiful it just looks fabulous and it's such a connection to the past such a strong connection but like really in this particularly in the west of Ireland there's still these strong connections like that in County Clare that bush 
you know, there being such support to, to protect the, uh, to, to, to not allow the motorway to, to, to destroy the bush, uh, the Hawthorn bush in County Clare. Um, so these things are still alive and strong in people's minds, um, particularly uh, the Hawthorn and uh, the scattering of flowers on May Eve. Um, and also the flowers were, were a way of, of protecting against the Cadiff, so they were um, um, yeah, protective energy, I suppose, against the Cadiff. Another lovely tradition was the bathing in dew from the grass on uh, the, at dawn on May the 1st, on the morning of May the 1st. And it was, the dew was considered magical because it just appears on the grass. So this was, the water from the dew was supposed to bring protection and luck and beauty. And also it was considered to be most effective at dawn because it's a liminal time. It's a time between uh, dark and light. So yeah, absolutely fascinating. So that's very commonly known about and still done. I think if you're up at dawn anyway, on the 1st of May, you can bathe in the, in the dew on the grass uh, to bring you uh, luck and uh, good fortune. Um, hi again everybody and I just got cut off before I had a chance to finish the very last part of this podcast. So I'm just going to take another little bit of coffee. I hope you're enjoying your drink and uh, your knitting. And um, I'm just going to finish off the little bit about Bjautna and um, just to let you know that a lot of these customs, as I was saying, are not practiced anymore, but um, the scattering of the flowers at the doors and the thresholds does still happen in some places and certainly in the town near where I live in Mayo in the west of Ireland. So there's another one of another fire. So Bjautna is a fire festival and the celebration of Bjautna um, has been revived in recent years through a fire festival that's held at a place called Ishnach, which is in County Westmeath, which is right in the very, very centre of Ireland. It's called the Navel of Ireland. And Ruben wants to come in and say quick hello. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ruben. <laughs> yeah, I put the stickers on the door. Okay, fantastic, yeah. thanks. I'll have to come and have a look later, okay? Okay. So Bjaltana is celebrated as a fire festival in a place called Ishnach, which is right at the centre of Ireland and um, is a sacred site, basically. And um, it is uh, thought to be the very centre or the navel of the country. And so it's, it has a particular energy about it. And um, it was the point at which all of the four provinces met and all of the four high kings would have gathered there. Uh, and all of the Druids would have gathered to celebrate, um, particularly Bealthna, this fire festival. And so if you look online, actually, you can go on YouTube and you can put in the word Ishnach, which is spelled U-I-S-N-E-A-C-H. I'll put it up here on the screen and you'll see this incredible fire festival. So if you ever get a chance to visit, it's really highly recommended. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but this sacred site is thought to be the resting place of Eru. And Eru is the goddess, one of the um, the female goddesses of Mother Earth, and it's the name. Her name is what the land of Ireland um, got its name from. So Ireland, in the Gaelic language, is Era, uh, and Era comes from the goddess Eru, which means Mother Mother Earth. And um, so she's the middle goddess of the triple goddess, the triple female goddess of the. Uh, the triple, um, you have the youthful maiden, which was called Banba, and then you had Eru, which was uh, the mother goddess pregnant in the spring and um, giving birth in the autumn through the harvests, and so she represents Mother Earth, and then you have Fola, the, uh, the wise old crone. So, yeah, so Ireland actually gets its name from Mother Earth, from the goddess of the mother, um, of the Earth Mother which is absolutely incredible to think about. This is something that we were never taught in school. Um, this is something that I've only learned about in recent years, and it's really so important. It's so precious. This is why the Irish language is actually so precious, because it holds all of this um, knowledge, and this, this understanding of where we come from and the culture that we come from. 
and that how important the earth is and how important it is considered and how it was the mother, it was what fed us, it was what gave us all that we needed to be comfortable in our lives, all of the trees that were used for all sorts of purposes, um, for shelter, for, um, for fire, for heat, for cooking, for, um, yeah, for, for also for shelter um, in many ways, not just for building. Um, and why, tra why trees were considered to be sacred. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, a really important piece of information that I've only learned about in recent years. And I think it's lovely to share it with you all, um, just so that you know we, we can return to this way of understanding of the importance of the earth for us and, and perhaps learn a little bit more how to, to start um, reconnecting with it. Um, and honouring it and uh, realising its, its importance for, for our survival and for our, for our well-being. Um, so what was interesting though that even throughout the Christian era in Ireland and the coming of Christianity, the mother remained a really important, um, uh, I suppose, sacred being and this came through in the veneration, the particular veneration of Mary, the mother of Christ, the mother of Jesus. So Mary uh, is venerated here still more so than any other of the, the Christian figures. And this is borne out through the number of um, wayside shrines to Our Lady that can be seen all over the country and particularly in Mayo. I've been traveling around Mayo recently for my work and I have been astounded by the number of um, these beautifully kept, beautifully curated um, shrines to mother, the mother. Mary. Um, so this this link to um, to Eru in our in the Irish veneration and and adoration worship of of, of the mother of Mary. Um, and that brings us back to May again because I remember in school, so because we were brought up in the Christian tradition, in the Catholic tradition, um, May was the time when we had a special altar to Mary and we used to decorate it with all of the wildflowers that, that would have been around at the time. So it was the May altar. I don't know if anybody else out there remembers having a May altar in school. This would have been in the 70s and the 80s in Ireland and uh, it was a really big thing. So that really is, you know, it's amazing that even, so even though we were um, honouring the mother, we were honouring the mother and we were, uh, we were using flowers to do it. So these are things that came from the folk tradition but that were overlaid by, um, I suppose, the, the Catholic Church and by the, by, by the Christian religion. Um, but still that connection was there. So I just feel that there's such a connection in this country to our past and we're just beginning to re-remember it as well. Um, that's, uh, I think that really is where I will end my talk about Bialtana. It's the beginning of summer. It's a fabulous time of the year. The evenings now are stretching right up to nine o'clock in the evening. It's uh, bright from, I don't know, what's it's half six in the morning, possibly six o'clock in the morning. So we've got really, really long days, which means there's so much more energy about. Um, the trees are all beginning to come into leaf and um, the hawthorn is beginning to come into flower. I'll just give you one last final look at the beauty of the, um, the blossoms of the hawthorn. Um, so wherever you are, I hope you are able to celebrate the beginning of summer on the 1st of May and um, that you, yeah, you enjoy getting out more as well and getting out into, into the outdoors. And, um, and start, if you're growing food or if you're growing crops or if you're growing whatever, that um, it's starting to, everything is starting to, to come into, um, into life now. The, 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 the winter is very well and truly over, even though we've had a few frosts recently, but it's definitely getting into that lovely, lovely summertime. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening and for watching and I really hope you've enjoyed this content and I've really had such pleasure today um, sharing this knowledge with you, which for me is so important and it's so uh, lovely to research it for you because some of it I know, some of it I don't and I'm reminded of, of, um, of new things or things I knew and I've learned a lot of new stuff as well. So please like and subscribe to the channel if you like the content. <laughs> And um, Ruben is coming in again, and I will just be with you in one second, Ruben. If you, yeah. well, you're showing me all of your. Yeah, um, I'm just missing the first Harry one. Your Harry Potter. This is Ruben's Harry Potter collection. He's a big fan of Harry Potter, 
So we're just missing the first one. I'm sure it's around the yeah. house somewhere. I'm sure it's around somewhere. Good man. Look how thick the fifth one is. Yeah. It's fabulous, <laughs> fabulous. So I was just saying goodbye. And actually, one thing I thought I would do is share with you, in every podcast, I would share with you a shanakal or a, uh, an old wise saying or a proverb. And the one I thought I'd share with you this week is um, about the Irish language, which I was saying is so important. That meaning of, of the word era is such an important meaning. And um, so this channel is, it goes Baha uh, Antanga e Elawert. So it means the life of a language is in the speaking of it. Baha Antanga e Elawert. So leave that lovely phrase with you and just a few words of Irish to finish. Um, uh, Gormil Mahagov Galer, Os Vehig, Egg, Fehant, August Egg, Crustal, Less Flesh and Podcast Show, August, um, uh, Buichs Moor, Div Galer, Buichs Moor, August Banacht, Slon, August Banacht, uh, Slon Gafol, Goody on Podcast, Shahogan, Slon. A stranger in the night Take a chance for some romance Don't copy your eyes Will our trees know you better than anyone else? It's time you let your guard down For someone like me I'd say I'm settled and pretty calm. I don't storm in the storm. If not me, then someone like me that knows what to do and how to take care of you. But most of all, that deserves you. Red sheep I'd ever seen. You stand beside me in every dream. Angel goddess, you cover them all. Say, what can I do to get you to fall? For someone like me. Deserves you. Go with someone like me.
this real Maybe we should hurry up and seal the deal